Hello, I'm John White, a professional performance historian who, for over 25 years, has interpreted events from the past through the portrayal of in excess of 30 characters. Of all the characters I portray, it is my representation of King Henry VIII that proves the most popular. I present the King as he would have appeared in the year 1544, when he was aged 53 and married to his new and sixth wife. We hope that you enjoy what the King has to say. My loyal subjects, once more I do join you from a place of isolation uh, where we are still uh, taking refuge from the great contagion. You will recall that some days since I did engage in a Q&A and was pleased to answer questions submitted by my goodly and loyal subjects spread across the face of the world. We have been mightily impressed by the number of questions that have been submitted. Indeed, in our last Q&A, we did answer 10 such questions. Now, I have a further 10 questions, uh, which I'll be pleased to address with you. Uh, the first question today is from a Master Towner, Master Ricky Towner, from Birmingham in England. He asks, Your Majesty, did you truly love any of your wives, or were they simply just marriages of convenience, of status, or to produce an heir? And secondly, uh, do you have any true regrets for how you treated them? Well, I did marry my first wife, Aragon, for I did truly love her. As I did say in a, a previous answer of all the women in the world, it was she I did choose, but she did fail me in that she did not produce a male heir. I then did marry my second wife, Berlin, for I was truly captivated by her, struck with the dart of love. I did marry the mistress Berlin, I did make her my queen, and I did hope for an heir, a girl and two dead boy children is all she produced and then hmm, she did play me false the poisoning witch and whore Berlin but then I did marry my third wife beloved Jane Seymour of glorious memory she in that year of 15 and 37 did give unto me a fine healthy boy Edward born upon the feast of St Edward at last my people had something to rejoice of, a lawfully begotten son born of the king's body. But then, it did please the Lord our God to take my beloved Jane from me. <laughs> Thence, hmm, I did marry my fourth wife, the Flanders mayor, I, Anna of Cleves. I did marry Anna of Cleves. Firstly, in the hope of a son, and secondly, for dynastic reasons. For England did need friends, we did live in perpetual fear of attack, of invasion. Indeed, the Pope, the Pope did urge mine enemies to attack England. I did not care for the, the Flanders mare. I did like her not. After six months, that marriage was annulled, and thence... I did think I had found true love, my fifth wife, Catherine Howard. My rose without a thorn, a delight. She would dance, and she would dance, and she would dance. And thence was proven she did dance to the tune of other men. She was not in a state of grace, and for this she did die. Now, by the grace of God, I am married to my sixth and present wife, uh, the Dowager Lady Latimer, Mistress Catherine Parr, for she is most kindly, for I am indeed old and do not care to be alone. <laughs> In your question, Master Towner, you ask, did I truly love any of my wives? The honest answer to this is that kings do not marry for love. Kings marry to sire children. Kings do marry to beget of sons. A son 
is a king's most important possession. If a king cannot have a son, then all matters as noughts. If love does come, all well and good, and yes, in turn, I did, in differing ways, love each of my wives. Regrets, you ask? <laughs> Aye, I have a few, but perhaps too many to dilate upon here. But Master Towner, I do thank you for your most thought-provoking question. Of the many questions we have received, uh, some are most similar. I have a question uh, from a person, an Ipsil. I'm not aware of where they reside. In any event, uh, an Ipsil does ask, please speak of Sir Thomas More. And similarly, uh, a lady, uh, Mistress Karen Kossar, uh, of a place that is far distant, Australia, she does ask, you liked to debate theology with Sir Thomas More. Do you regret having him beheaded? And did anyone wish to debate theology with you after? Aye, ah. Sir Thomas More. When I was a boy, Thomas More, he was my hero. As a young man, we would oft keep company. We would discuss matters of divinity, matters of worldly affairs, and thence we would oft scramble to the rooftops of the the castle, the palace, and there we would observe the very movements of the heavens, for we did both share an interest in astronomy. Thomas More was my most trustworthy minister, a most honest man, but no man, no man can have two masters. And when, of necessity, I did have to break with room uh, in the situation of my first wife, the Spanish cow, and achieve that annulment I needed in order to marry again to secure an heir for my realm on the subject of the marriage to Mistress Berlin, Sir Thomas More, he would not bend the knee. All of my subjects, you indeed, did all take an oath the great oath of supremacy, an oath that did recognise me in consequence of Act of Parliament as to be head of the English Church, head of the Church in England. A form of words, an oath. That's all it was. That's all it was. But Sir Thomas More, my most dependable of ministers and advisers, he, he was a true man of the Church. His heart was with Rome. He would not take of the oath in that act of Parliament. Failure to take of the oath was treason, and treason is death. Thus, the lawful process did take its course, more having been kept in straight terms in the Tower of London, did stand trial the great hall at Westminster before a jury of common men, for Moore was naught but a common man, although having once been my Lord Chancellor, he did stand trial for treason. Those goodly citizens of London did find Moore guilty, and he was sentenced to that death, the death that falls to all traitors, men who are traitors, to be hanged, to be drawn, and to be quartered. I did remit the sentence in recognition of our long friendship to the dignity and mercy of death by the axe. It is true, I do miss more, a man possessed of a a great intellect, a great mind. There was naught upon which Sir Thomas More could not discourse, but, but, to frustrate your king is treason. I, I am no tyrant. I am no tyrant. But is it not treason to obstruct your king? And thus, 
in the eyes of the law. More was guilty and more did die. And yes, I do miss him. I sometimes forget that he's dead. <laughs> I dream of him. I think that perhaps we're having a conversation and then I realize he's not there. Or I think there is something I must ask Thomas More, and then I realize he is not there. Yes, I regret more. As to theology, the only person who delights in discussing uh, theological matters with me is now my present wife, Queen Catherine Parr. She has written a book and had it published in her own name. Uh, on matters of theology, divinity, and such like. She does delight in speaking of theology. Uh, sometimes I wonder who is the king and who is the subject. She's almost as a teacher and will perhaps seek to teach me all of theology. Hmm. One of all subjects, yes, I have another. Uh, question via YouTube uh, from a lady, Mistress Natalie Jones. She does thank me for uh, entertaining my uh, loyal subjects with our uh, films of late. And then there is the question um, Is there a fact in history that is actually incorrect about my reign? Well, actually, there are several facts that are incorrect. Facts that I know are oft repeated in your time, the modern time. The first fact, I, your king, did never ever suffer from syphilis. I am my own doctor. All of my illnesses and remedies are recorded. If you were to look at that record, you would see no trace. No trace whatsoever of the French distemper, the French disease, the French disorder, and the administration of the only perceived cure, mercury. Mercury sulfate. Mercury sulfate does give pronounced salivation. Those who have taken the mercury cure, like the King of France, Francis, King of France, he did take the mercury cure, for he did quite fittingly have the French distemper, the box. This mercury gives the pronounced salivation, and you dribble, and you drool, and you're very moist. It is the belief that this salivation is the cleansing of the system. But it is a fact. If you should be stricken with the pox, and then be taken with the mercury cure, it is a race to see which will kill you first, the pox or the mercury. I did not ever have syphilis. Uh, another point that needs to be checked. I did injure my leg in the year of 1536, having injured it many times before, and thus I do often hobble on my leg. Some believe I have gout. <laughs> nay, nay, I do not have gout. I have a leg that has an open wound, the disease of pus and blood, and which has caused me a great deal of pain. Thirdly, the incorrect facts that need setting right. I was born a Catholic. I practice the true Catholic faith. I, of necessity, did sever my links with Rome, but in particular, I did sever my links with the Pope. And by act of parliament, I did become head of the church in England. I was born, I do live, and I will die a Catholic. Oft it is said that I was a Protestant, a Protestant. This is not true. And that I did form the Church of England. <laughs> there is no Church of England in my time. It is the Catholic Church in England. So those are the three points I would seek to rectify. The pox, the gouts, and matters relating to the church. 
I do thank you for your question. I'm in receipt of an additional question from Mistress Lynn Edgar of a place called New York. Oh, I know of York. York is to the north of my realm. I have visited York. I'm not familiar with New York. But in any event, she does ask. They say that uh, Anne Boleyn's last words were her profession of love for me. I wonder, Mistress Edgar, how many executions have you been to? You see, as you do stand upon the scaffold, the axeman has the weapon of death in his very hands, and you are indeed just a few heartbeats from death yourself. It is customary, indeed, for those who are to die uh, to make great pronouncements, often praising the king and such like. For, and Berlin was no different in this respect, there is always the chance, always the chance, that a messenger may arrive with a last minute reprieve. And so, <laughs> would anybody who was about to die, but in the hope of a reprieve, would they stand there and say detrimental matters to me the king, or of me the king. Of course, they all declare wonderful fealty to the king. Indeed, Berlin did oft look from the scaffold across the heads of the crowd in expectation of a reprieve. <laughs> that reprieve did not come, and she did die. <laughs> Whilst? Whilst we're on the subject of heads, <laughs> I have a question here from a young fellow, his aged nine, uh, named Xavian. Again, I know not where he resides, for this question did arrive via YouTube. But he does ask this young fellow, Your Majesty, did people put traitors' heads on spikes to warn people of the repercussion of treason? My mother likes Tudor history. And also me. Well, I congratulate you for that, Xavian. Yes, heads were put upon London Bridge. In particular, they were located on the Surrey Bank, that is, the south end of the bridge, across the river from the City of London. They did stand upon spikes. So all those who did enter the city of London, uh, crossing the river at London Bridge, it being the only bridge across the river, would see arrayed above them the heads of those traitors. For in my time, justice not only had to be done, it had to be seen to be done. And there, this array of heads was a very stark and visible reminder to behave yourself. Indeed, it was a poor fellow who lived in the lodge at that part of the bridge, who was known as the keeper of the heads. It was his responsibility to place those heads upon the spikes. Now a head, a fresh head, is boiled in salted water, flavoured with cumin seeds to aid the stink. The head is boiled and boiled and boiled until it is quite black. In this boiled state, the blood having been removed, it is found that the birds, the crows and such like, do not peck at it quite so much. The head in its boiled state lasts so much longer, so it is there all the longer for people to observe. Xavier, it is quite a gory question for a nine-year-old but I do thank you for your question. <laughs> uh, further questions that have arrived hither by that contrivance entitled YouTube. Uh, thus, I am not aware where these people reside, but I have a question from a lady, a mistress, who terms herself Diana D. She asks, Your Majesty, which of your many palaces and royal houses was your favourite residence? This is a goodly question. In truth, I have some 60 houses, castles and palaces spread across the length and breadth of this mine realm. When I do go upon progress, it is my want to visit many of these houses whilst also staying at the, the homes of my friends, of my courtiers. But you see, 
It is those palaces and houses that are around London that are of uh, significant importance. London is a place of great stinks and pestilence. One would be wise to be rid of London, particularly during the, the warm months. Oh. And thus my courts will move, aye, Whitehall Palace, in the very centre of London, is the biggest palace in the world. Whitehall Palace is the centre of my governance, the seat of dynastic power. Thence I have a most delightful house upon the Thames. Hampton Court, so kindly gifted to me by my late friend, Cardinal Wolsey. Then in Surrey I have none such palace. In Berkshire I have uh, uh, Windsor Castle. There is Richmond and all manner of different houses. But yes, I think London in Whitehall is the seat of my power and uh, Hampton Court is best for the river. I have a question here from Master Rob Chilton of Cheshire. He asks, when will we be delivered from the scourge of the Covids? Is the contagion a judgment upon this realm because of my break with Rome? Well, some weeks ago I did discuss the emergence of the contagion. It is a fact that history has shown time on time that when there are two popes, contagion will follow. We do live in a time when there are indeed two popes, and thus the contagion has come upon us. However, is it a judgment for my break with Rome? No, it is not. For I'm told by my dispatches from my uh, ambassadors and such like spread across the royal courts of Europe that there is the contagion in Spain, in France, and in other realms and principalities. This is a scourge that has been sent upon us by the Lord our God, which we all must play our parts in order to defeat the scourge of the Covid, to defeat the contagion by keeping safe in isolation. I thank you for your question. Similarly, I have another question from a, a mistress, Joanna Vardy, who um, says she resides in the UK. Uh, I'm not familiar with the UK. Perhaps it's Uck. Perhaps she resides in somewhere called Uck. Anyway, she said, I have noticed the similarities between the break with Rome and Brexit. Did the break with Rome set the tone for Brexit? Does Brexit have its roots in the break with Rome? I know of Brexit. I have been told of it. I, You see, when I did break with Rome, I did make breaking with Europe fashionable, did I not? <laughs> but in any event, I can have no opinion upon Brexit. Safe to say that when I did break with Rome, I did take back unto myself sovereign power. Tis I who rule here. The Pope is a foreign prince with no jurisdiction in this realm. Thus, I did exert by ancient precedents the fact that in history, the kings of England have never had any superior other than God. And thus, I did break with Rome. There may be some similarities in the, uh, the hyperbole that may have been spoken about Brexit. It is for you to decide. And for tonight, I have one final question. This is from Mistress Leslie Ann Cooper, who similarly resides in Uck, or the UK. She asks, do you think a vegan diet would have helped in your quest for a son with a plant-based diet you may have seen several babies. Hmm. I think some days since when I did discuss the matter of my diet, I did dilate upon the fact that I do enjoy the very best of diets. I do eat a flesh in all forms. All beasts, birds, fowls of the air, beasts of the sea, beasts of the field, all manner of flesh. And I did pass the comment that it is those of the lesser sort who do oft exist upon vegetables, which is indeed common food for common people. But I take your point. 
a plant-based diet may have seen several babies. Hmm. It is an interesting point. There is no doubt that my loyal subjects of lesser degree, the common people, those who do live and work in the muck and filth of our towns, upon the fields and such like, they seem to spawn babies without any difficulty. So perhaps, hmm, perhaps there may be something in your notion, but am I not a man like any other? It seems that all the world had a son. Yet I had to wait and wait and wait until that year of 15 and 37 when my son, the Prince Edward, did first see the lights. But I do thank you for your question. I will consider aspects of a plant-based diet. My loyal subjects, I have been pleased to answer a number of questions. When you return next week, I will have answers to a further series of questions. I hope they do entertain and inform. And as we continue in isolation, I do urge you all to live in safety and security, that we may beat the scourge of the covens, that you may live in peace, unity and concord, one with another, and may the Lord our God be pleased to bless you all.